Come and have a look at this. I'm Richard Vobes, TV's bald explorer, and I'm discovering Britain. Today, I'm in the Sussex downland village of Slindon, close to Arundel, the seat of the Dukes of Norfolk. Slindon has a claim to the birthplace of cricket. However, in this episode, I'm seeking an architectural gem, cast aside and nearly lost forever. It's only survived thanks to the dedication of the local community. Care to join me? My exploration today takes me to the southeast of England on the search of anvils, cricket balls, and pumpkins. Nestling in the foothills of the South Downs in Sussex is the village of Slindon. It's charming and on the whole unspoilt. Around me are brick and flint houses, which are in turn surrounded by beech woods, farms, and open downland. The National Trust plays an important part here, caring for the landscape and responsible for many of the houses. It must be a tricky task maintaining a balance between keeping tradition and satisfying modern day necessities. Steeped in history, Slindon offers much to ponder on, including its claim to be the place where cricket was first played. The sheep-gazing counties of southern England are a likely contender because the short grass of the downland pastures made it possible to bowl a ball of wool or rags at a target. And that target was probably the wicket gate of a sheep enclosure, no doubt defended with a bat in the form of a shepherd's crooked staff. A quiet country pastime that's turned into a global sport. Another site seen all over Sussex, and the rest of Britain for that matter, from early days to fairly recently, was the Blacksmith's Forge, or Smithy. And there's one at Slindon. It's no longer a forge, although from the outside, you may well be deceived. I'm Mike Imms, and I'm Secretary of Slindon Forge Society. Originally the forge was the Blacksmith's Workshop, and it was a place where the horses came to be shod, but also lots of other metalworking activity. They didn't just do, do, do with horses, they made things like fire grates and gates and all that kind of thing. Uh, Gilbert Bleethman, who was one of the longest standing, was here from about 1912 to about 1940. And that's Jock Taylor, who was here in the 1970s, well, the 1950s and 60s before Peter, and his widow Stella still lives opposite. This was the Slindon Estate Forge for the whole village built sometime around 1817 to 1819. I think the thing about the forge is it's always been at the heart of the village. It was before and it is still again, um, but in a very different kind of way. If you go back to about 1900, then the blacksmith's workshop was very much at the economic heart of what went on in the village because everything that moved had a horse in front of it and a blacksmith behind it. Uh, and you couldn't move, basically, without the horses being shod. That applied to public transport, it applied to, you know, obviously private horses, private carriages, but it also applied to the movement of all goods and services around the village. It applied to agriculture, you didn't have tractors, of course, they had horse-drawn ploughs, etc, etc. And in addition, the blacksmith made a lot of farm equipment or repaired it and also a lot of household metal goods were repaired by the blacksmith so you could almost say that without a blacksmith in the village the economic life of the place would have ground to a halt um, but obviously all that changed in the period after the first world war you when you got mechanization uh, and effectively by about 1970 the blacksmith was an endangered species and the blacksmith's workshops all over the country were becoming derelict But the Slindon community weren't content to allow their precious forge to crumble away. With pubs closing, post offices vanishing and village shops becoming extinct, the forge still had a glimmer of light. The last blacksmith restored the building in the 1970s, um, but that of course was then 40 years on and it needed an awful lot of work again. 
and it had no facilities, it just had a tap and one PowerPoint, and that was all. The roof was leaking, the walls were down, the old half was, was, was in a state of near collapse, uh, and it wouldn't have been very much longer before the whole thing would have just literally fallen down. A community group, the Slindon Forge Society, formed to save the forge and turn it into a new focal point for the village. We acquired the lease from the National Trust, who owned the estate, uh, and we set about restoring it and building an extension so it could fulfil that new role. And it took us a while to raise all the money. Uh, a lot of it came from people within the village. We had a community share offer, which raised quite a lot of money. And we were lucky enough to get quite a lot of grant money because obviously providing essential services and improving the sustainability of the village is exactly the kind of thing that so many organisations want to achieve. It wasn't too difficult because so many people from the planners down thought it was a strong idea and they also thought it was a very effective mod contemporary use for a building that wasn't accessible to the public but was still historically important and was at, was at risk. Now the forge flourishes as a shop, cafe, gallery, meeting place, exhibition hall and so much more. One of the, the more striking features of it is where we filled in the original doors with a big plate glass window. David Peduzzi, who lives opposite, created a wonderful window um, for us, which looks like etched glass, but it isn't. I'm not going to tell you the secret of that. Uh, but it's a wonderful feature. And again, it's celebrating the history of the building and its original role. In the autumn, Slindon is renowned for its pumpkin festival. The displays, which began in 1968, attract people from all over the world who come to see the 50-plus varieties of pumpkin and over 30 different types of squash. How does the forge cope with the sudden influx of people? Well, the pumpkins is, uh, is great, actually. I mean, an enormous number of people come here and enjoy it. It does give us a bit of a headache at trying to serve all the people who want to come here. You know, when they're queued out the door and you can't get in to buy a, you know, a carrot and a few potatoes because you really can't afford to wait for half an hour. But that's the kind of problem that's nice to have, being too popular. I'm certain that the old blacksmiths who laboured here long and hard would be proud. And those two characters there, which I always think look terrible reprobates, but his great-granddaughter told me he was a lovely man, so I was told off for calling him that. Well, I think it's fabulous to see these old buildings still in community use. Their historic value is maintained and untarnished by the small changes to the architecture, and they still serve the locals and visitors alike. Personally, I think it's brilliant how the community got together to rescue the old forge. So much of our heritage is disappearing under the concrete of modern day. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, join me again the next time I go bald exploring.